Good morning, my friends. How are you? Good. Good morning, Scarlett. It is so good to see you, sweetie. So glad to be here with y'all. I wish all of you were as happy to see me as Scarlett is, um, but I understand. It's good to see you guys. Uh, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 4. As Scarlett has so kindly announced, I'm Kyle, and I serve as the lead pastor here. I want to thank you if you're visiting with us or uh, maybe in person or online for the first time. We want to say thanks uh, for joining us. Um, we are in the midst of <clears throat> the second half, kind of the early part of the second half of a series we've uh, called The Big Picture. And The Big Picture is just telling of the importance of understanding Scripture <clears throat> but not just Scripture, what Scripture is saying as a whole. Now, as a whole, Scripture is telling one story, all right? Scripture is telling one story as a whole, though written across 1,500 or so years by 40-plus different authors, there is one story being told. That's the story of God's redemption of mankind and creation, amen? And so this is what we're seeing in Scripture. Now, what we've said about this story of redemption is that it can be summed up this way. And, and notice the four uses of God here, because <laughs> it centers around Him. But God's people enjoying God's presence within God's place for God's purpose. This is a story of redemption. It's a story that's unfolding time and time again throughout Scripture. It's a story that we can look forward to unfolding finally, forever, completely at the end of all things as we see in Revelation 21 and 22. This is the story of God's redemption. God's people enjoying God's presence within God's place for God's purpose. Now today I want to point you to the story of a people who are without God's presence outside of God's place, and living for their own purpose. They are in what we might call utter darkness, or what Scripture will call darkness. In this story, I think we can ask and answer, what was the mission of Jesus? What was Jesus' mission on earth? What is it that he came to do? Now, in some ways, we've covered this to a great extent, uh, and I just hope to build on that today as we look at his mission. Let me pray for us, and then we'll dive into this. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have now uh, to, to hear your word, and not from me as though it comes from my mouth, but from you as though it comes through your Holy Spirit. And so help us to be attentive listeners to your word today, Father. Help us to glean from it truths that will change our lives. And in that vein, I want to ask, Lord, that you would grant us the illumination of the Holy Spirit, that he, Father, dwelling in us, would help us to understand what we read, but not just in our minds, but deep down in our hearts, that we too become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you've given us all the tools necessary for such a task, that we have in Scripture all that is sufficient for life and salvation. And so help us now, Father, be students of your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. <clears throat> so last week in, in John chapter 3, we kind of camped out. We, we looked at um, just the, kind of the introduction of, of Jesus through the ministry of John the Baptist. And so we concluded there with Jesus' baptism. And in that picture there, in that story, you had the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, which we come to later find out in, in John's gospel, that that was the sign that had been given to John that this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And so we have the Spirit descend like a dove onto Christ, and a voice speaks from the heavens. It's the Father telling about the Son. He says, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And what we glean from that is that in Christ, if we are in Christ by faith, the Father now looks at us and says, this is my child, in whom I am well pleased, because of Christ. And so if you need that message, I encourage you to go back and listen to last week's passage. What we see at the beginning of John chapter 4, and I'm just for time's sake, and we want to get to communion here in a little bit, I'm not going to read all of this, uh, so I'm just going to kind of give you some overview. But what you see at the beginning of John chapter 4 is Jesus is then immediately led away by the Spirit which came and dwelt on him like a dove, is led away into the wilderness for a time of temptation from Satan. 
And then during that, he's, he's fasting and praying, and, and Satan comes to tempt Christ, and he gives him three different temptations, each promising more than the, than the previous one. And each time Christ refuses, but he doesn't just refuse, and it's not just a sheepish, sheepish sorry, refusal, it's an authoritative refusal in which he's standing on the promises of God. He's standing on God's word in his refusal. He cites scripture each time. And after the third time we read, and Satan left him and angels came to minister to him. That word minister to him means that they came and took care of him like a waiter takes care of you at a restaurant. They probably fed him. <laughs> John's gospel records a few events that, that Matthew leaves out between this temptation and then the passage that we're going to look at today. So I just want to kind of catch you up. In John chapter 2, after the, some days had passed from Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist then announces Christ as the Son of God. And he says it this way. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. So John, again, it had been confirmed through the Spirit descending that this is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And so he announces that. In John chapter 3, you have the Pharisee, Nicodemus, coming to Jesus under the cover of night and inquiring about the teachings of Christ. He engages him concerning the teaching and uh, his teaching and the scriptures, what he knew about them. And Jesus makes some massive statements in John chapter 3, things like this, you must be born again if you are to be saved. You must be born again. John really wrestled with that. He's like, how can I be reborn? Jesus says rebirth happens by the Spirit of God. It comes to you by the Spirit of God, and no one knows to, who, to where the Spirit go, blows. It's like the wind. No one knows where it's blowing to or from. And then he announces that great text that we all learn at about four or five years old, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his son to save all who will believe in him, that they may not perish but have everlasting life. And then he says, light has come into the world, but the people have rejected it because they love the darkness more than the light. John chapter 3 is an amazing chapter in Scripture. And then from where we get from there, we go into John chapter 4. Again, all this is happening between the baptism of Christ and the passage we're going to look at. So I'm just building some context for you. In John chapter 4, Jesus ministers to the Samaritan woman at the well. And in doing so, there's a few big things happening. One is he's breaking down the barriers that existed between Jews and Gentiles. The second thing, and, and, and greater even still, is he is showing that the gospel is meant for the whole world. Remember, in John chapter 3, he just announced, for God so loved the world. And what he means is God loves all the peoples of the world. This is back to Genesis chapter 12. All the nations of the earth will be blessed, Abraham, through your offspring. Who's the offspring in mind? Christ. Remember, Matthew opens his gospel in Matthew 1. This is the son of Abraham, the son of David. So it's Christ who is the offspring who will bless the nations, bless all the nations of the world. And so Jesus is showing the Samaritan woman that this gospel is meant for all peoples, even those who are thought to be far off and outside of its reach. They are not. And then he's announcing to her and her salvation that it has the power to save desperate sinners. Amen? That no one is too far off. This woman had been a serial adulterer, and Christ announces the forgiveness of sins and salvation to her. Praise God. And then we pick up in Matthew chapter 4. Let's look at verse 12. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. This is right after, in Matthew's gospel, the temptation that he was, or, or the, the wilderness temptation there. And then those other things took place in John's gospel. And then now we're here in Matthew chapter 4. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali. 
I just want to make some notes here. First of all, just kind of as a side note, a, a pastoral note for you, that is something that a, a broken heart, a crushed spirit might want to hear in, a, in their moment of despair is these three words, when he heard. When Christ heard, heard what? When he heard of John's arrest, he came. Brothers and sisters, you will not ever endure such a hardship that would prevent Christ, that would prevent Christ from hearing your cries of distress. You understand what we read here is that Jesus remembers his people in all of their afflictions remembers them in all of their afflictions. And what Hebrews 4 tells us is that he not only remembers those afflictions, he sympathizes with us in our afflictions. Now, sympathy is different and better, far better than the cries for empathy we have today. Sympathy is the ability to be on the outside of what you're going through and yet step into and be able to pull you out of. This is the kind of sympathy that Christ offers. It's an understanding of what you're going through, but rather than having to dive down into it with you, he is stronger than you and can pull you out of it. And so we praise Christ for his ability to sympathize with us and not to empathize. To empathize would mean that he too was a sinner and he was not, praise God. But he pulls us out even even if the affliction takes your life. What does Christ say? Do not fear the ones who can harm body, but fear the one who can harm soul, right? Fear God is what he's saying. And so if anything takes our life on this earth, we must know that even so, to live is Christ, but to die is gain, great gain, eternal gain, Amen. More to the point, though, that was a pastoral aside, I might add. We, when, when he heard, just going back to the passage here, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Jesus did not go until he had heard of John's arrest. Why? He, he didn't go into Galilee before John's arrest, but why? Well, the forerunner needed time to prepare the way of the Lord. This was, his, this was John's calling from the womb, before the womb. At his conception was to prepare the way of the Lord. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb to prepare the way of the Lord. And once he did that, once he completed that ministry, and now he is in jail for standing up to Herod, now Jesus can appear. You see, John had done his work, and now he must fade into black so that Christ may shine forth. John's ministry was to announce the Lamb of God. It wasn't to rival the Lamb of God, but you can imagine it, right? In the same way we see it in Corinthians, that if you have a man of God here and a man of God here, such as Apollos and Paul, it's easy for the people to become divided. It would be easy for someone to say, well, I'm, I'm of John, if John's ministry is still going it would be easy for someone to say, well, I'm of, I'm of Jesus, as his ministry is coming on the scene, just as they did with Apollos and Paul. This is why John was so adamant about his place. I am not fit to even lace up his sandals. He must become greater. I must become less and less. This is how John was preparing the way of the Lord. It wasn't just by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at its hand. It was by saying, this is the Lord, this is the Son of God, I am nothing like Him. This is what ministers ought to be doing. This is how ministers ought to act. This is how Christians ought to act. We, we ain't Him, but we know Him. Amen? We are not to be worshipped as He is to be worshipped, but we want to point you to the kind of worship that He so rightly deserves and encourage you to do that. So Jesus goes into Galilee, and he does it to build upon John's good foundation. He does it to, to, to validate John's ministry. John had done his work oh so faithfully, but it wouldn't be 
a safe mission. It's not as though John had made the world safe and now Christ can come in and just, you know, dwell happily among the people and that he wouldn't ruffle any feathers. No, not at all. The Pharisees were as much a danger to Jesus as Herod had just been to John. Look no further than the content of each of the four gospel accounts. Take special notice when you get to the ends of those gospel accounts and you see the sections concerning Jesus' trials and execution. These Pharisees hated him. Now they don't know it yet, but they're going to hate him more. And then we read, And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So Jesus left Nazareth. This is the place where he grew up. This is the place that would have been familiar with to, to him. And you might think, well, well, maybe you would just stay there and kind of minister there and, and let things spread from there. Well, the truth is he was driven out of Nazareth because the people had hard hearts. They couldn't receive his gospel. They didn't want his gospel. To them, he was the guy that they grew up, you know, chunking rocks with. There was no way he could be the son of God as he was claiming. So he comes to dwell in Capernaum, which was a city of Galilee. Now this city was in a strategic location. It rested near the Sea of Tiberias or uh, Lake Gennesaret, as you might see it called. It didn't stay here forever, but it did act as a sort of headquarters because there was lots of trade ships, there's lots of movement, there's lots of hustle and bustle, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of people. It's a land filled with Gentiles and Jews. It was a great spot for the gospel to get its start. It doesn't stay forever. It's a headquarters of sorts. As we see later in the passage, though, he's welcomed here. We'll get to those in a moment. Now, that should provide us some comfort and some confidence. Because if some people are going to reject Jesus and his gospel, then we can rest assured there will be others who receive Jesus and his gospel. Gospel. Christ is going to be magnified either way. Now, this move, Matthew points out, is also a fulfillment of prophecy. Look at Matthew 4 14 through 16. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. This prophecy is from Isaiah 9. You might be familiar with it because we, we talk about it pretty much every Advent season. Every Christmas season we're going to mention this passage. Isaiah is saying there is a greater darkness of affliction on those who are going to reject Christ than there was on these regions during their captivities. When Jesus came to Capernaum, the gospel came to both Jews and Gentiles. The sun is now shining on the earth. Do not miss the state of the people here. We don't want to just quickly read through their state, what kind of people they were. We read that they dwell. To dwell here means it's the sense of having set down. They meant to make it a place for them to live. They were going to live and are currently living with no prospect to do anything other in great darkness. They have chosen darkness. They've set down. They now dwell in great dar darkness. But the dawning... It says, the dawning of a great light has appeared. And what's, what's Matthew's reference here? It's right as Jesus begins, it's right before we read that Jesus begins to preach. So who's the light? What's the light? It's Christ and his gospel message. That's the light that's appeared. But these people are in darkness. The, those, those that are without Christ are in darkness. The dark, but, but more than just kind of dwelling in the dark as something other than the dark, they are darkness. It's not that darkness just exists outside of them and they're kind of stuck in a dark, as, as you might be stuck in a dark room. 
They are the darkness that is in the dark room. People were not, people here were only said to dwell in the valley of the shadow of death when they were near death. This isn't something you would pronounce on people who had life in front of them. These are people who are near death or close to toppling over its edge. These people were on the edge of damnation. Not only are they there, they're sitting in it. They're dwelling in it. They've set up their camp in it. Their tents are there. They're comfy. They've got walkways, places of business. This is where they've chosen to live. And they meant to stay there. Why? Well, they didn't know any different. This is true of people who are darkness, who are in darkness. They're, they're ignorant to light. They're ignorant to anything else. The indictment in Corinthians is that they hate gospel truth. They oppose gospel truth. They cannot identify with gospel truth, nor can they even understand gospel truth. Why? Because they're not spiritually alive. They're in the dark. They're unlikely to find the way out. As Christ said in John chapter 3, they were in the dark and they loved darkness. They chose it rather than the light. They were willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. Their condition is the same of many today, though, is it not? Their condition is no different than what we observe in the land today. Their condition is no different than what we observe across the globe today. That there is darkness. There are people who are overwhelmed by great darkness living in the land. And such people are not to be hated such people are to be prayed for and wept over that God might save their souls. You see, their condition is worse because they sit in darkness in the midst of gospel light. The light has shone. The light has come. The light is here. We know truth, and yet people refuse it, choosing rather to sit in darkness. Matthew Henry says this, he says, He that is in the dark because it is night may be sure that the sun will shortly arise. If you find yourself in dark because it's night, you can be sure the sun is coming. This is true of Christians. We find ourselves in affliction. We find ourselves going through great trials. We find ourselves suffering for the sake of Christ. You can be sure the sun is coming though you are in the dark of night. But he, Matthew Henry goes on to say, he that is in the dark because he is blind, he that is in the dark because he is blind, will not so soon have his eyes opened. It is that darkness which makes the dawning of light so sweet to the soul. Light revives darkness. Light eliminates darkness. Light is a privilege to be enjoyed. It is a privilege to be enjoyed when gospel light shines on a sinner that is bound in the, the darkness of sin. It's a privilege. Where the gospel exists, we know that light exists, that that person is alive, that light is there. When the gospel comes to any place or to any soul, it makes it daytime there. The darkness flees because the light has come. The light is discovering, it's directing. This is what light does. This is why we walk around with flashlights in the dark. It discovers things. It directs our steps. And so, too, does the gospel of Jesus Christ. It illuminates. It directs steps. It gives us understanding. We can now walk in light where there is darkness. But Matthew wants to make a point about the arrival of Christ 
by citing Isaiah's prophecy. This is what he's doing, right? We're, we're just in chapter 4. In chapter 1 and 2 and 3, he's been announcing the arrival of Christ. He's announcing the inauguration of Christ's ministry and the inauguration of a new kingdom. He isn't just showing his readers that Jesus is the light. Rather, what he is acknowledging and what he is saying to his original audience and to you today is this, that Jesus is the great light. He's the great light. What was seen previously. This is what, this is what Matthew's doing. Again, his audience was largely Jewish. So he's writing to people who understand the Old Testament. What he's saying, and, and I hope that you have some grasp of the Old Testament as we've been walking through the series. What he is saying is this. What you have seen previously throughout the Old Testament is more akin to the light of a candle in a dark room. It's a flickering light. It's not a bright light. It's not a great light, but it's a, it's a useful light. It's a light that provides guidance and help. It's a light that reveals sin. But in Christ, we have the radiance of the glory of God. We have the exact imprint of God's nature. And so that is a light that is more like the light of the sun than the light of a candle. It is the great light. Amen? You see, the candlelight shone through God's law in the Old Testament. And there's grace all throughout the Old Testament. You can't miss grace in the Old Testament. It's there. But God's law is largely what the Old Testament is about. And there's light that comes with it, but it's a flickering light. It's a light meant to reveal the inconsistency of the light or, or the lack of light. The need for a greater light. But, but great, great, Isaiah says, and Matthew confirms, great is the light of Christ. Great is the light of the incarnate Son of God and the gospel that he brings with him. Here we see that this great light has dawned. What does it mean when something is dawning, when the sun is dawning on the earth? It means that it's springing up, right? That it's beginning. You're, you're getting glimpses of the first light. This is first light for these people. It's dawning in their darkness. This is amazing stuff. And now the light is, as it's dawning, what we see is that it is meant to grow more and more because what does the sun do? It dawns, but it grows to midday. It rises to midday, and it gives light to all that is beneath its, its, its light, its rays. For us, for you and I, the light has fully come. The light is at midday. The light is at its highest point, yet it is ever-expanding. We're not waiting for new light Rather, we are the light of the world in Christ Jesus, and we've been sent into the world to spread the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the light is expanding, but we're not waiting for new light. Amen? We just need to open some windows and doors that light might shine more. Now look at what Christ preached to the people as it's announced that he is this great light. Verse 17, From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached here the same message that John the Baptist preached, right? And it's the same message that's been preached for millennia since. The command is the same, and the reason for its enforcement is the same. You repent because you are not God. You repent and you turn to God because the kingdom of God is at hand. You repent of your sins, of your ungodliness, and you turn to God and receive godliness that you might actually glorify him in all the earth. This is the message that Christ is proclaiming an angel if an angel from heaven paul says were to come and preach another gospel do not listen to it he says you see an angel from heaven would not preach a different gospel than this gospel angels in heaven sit and 
in awe of the gospel that's taking place before their eyes. This is the everlasting gospel. Fear God and by repentance give Him glory, turning to worship Him by faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel of repentance is right doctrine. We need not leave behind the gospel of repentance. You and I live in a day where we think people have no need to repent unless it's for the sin that someone says you have committed. Then let all hell fall on your head. And still there's no opportunity for repentance. This is a worldly, that's a worldly gospel. It's an evil, evil way to live. There is no freedom in a teaching like that. There's no freedom in that. But there is complete and utter freedom from sin, utter freedom from darkness in this gospel of repentance, that you repent of your sins, that you repent of your darkness. You turn away from the darkness and you turn to the light of Christ. Both John and Jesus preached repentance. Now let's take that a step further in what's being revealed here because we don't want to miss, we don't want to, you don't want to miss or, or misunderstand what, what's happening in this moment. This is a shocking blessing. Th- this blessing ought to shock us out of ungodliness and unrepentance and drive us to godliness and repentance. It's a shocking blessing for this purpose. There's room left for repentance here. (laughs) These people were dwelling in great darkness. These people were sitting happily, you might say, in darkness, contentedly anyway. And yet, (laughs) the kindness of God shines forth and creates an opportunity for repentance. That's a shocking blessing. Why do I say it's a shocking blessing? Because it is undeserved, friends. The opportunity to repent is undeserved. That's what makes repentance repentance. That's what makes it so beautiful. This is why the kindness of God, Paul says, leads us to repentance. This is kindness revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, and it's what leads people to repent. It's what leads them to give their life to him. It's shocking because you and I, you and I are tempted to not leave room for such repentance. I mean, think about it, right? Somebody harms you. Somebody's hurt you, maybe hurt someone you're close to. Someone's been very spiteful, hateful, evil towards you. What's the first thing you want to do? Well, you'll be spiteful, evil. You may gossip. You may talk about it. You may... You may do whatever you can to make their life hell. And and Lord help you if their life isn't hell and it looks like they're getting along just fine having hurt you the way they did. Because what happens in that moment? Bitterness, anger, resentment, right? Well up in you. And you think, why in the world Why are they prospering? And here I am suffering because of the harm in which they've caused me. And so there's no room in your mind for repentance. That's the world we live in today. You cancel, right? You you, you call for their cancellation. But those, to those who have been forgiven much, Love much, Christ says. To those who have received the forgiveness of Christ, to those who understand, I was dwelling in great darkness. And yet, light shone on me. I was totally undeserved, undeserving of of such light because of the darkness of my iniquity. 
My iniquity led to the death of the only perfect man who's ever walked the face of the earth. My iniquity has caused my own heart and mind great vexation and trouble. My iniquity has hurt other people. I am the last person who deserves light. And yet it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. And when you understand that I I am the people in Naphtali, in Zebulun, I am the people dwelling in great darkness. When you see that in you and not out there as something that exists elsewhere, it's it's on the news at night, it's in that politician or, or that co-worker. I mean, it probably is, but when you see it as here first, your, your whole worldview changes, guys. And you understand that you would with, not withhold the forgiveness of God toward anyone. Because you are an undeserving recipient of grace. That's what grace is. So even just the allowance of <laughs> and the invitation to Repent and believe in Christ for the forgiveness of sins is unfathomable grace. Is it not? So what's the point I'm trying to make? I think the point is this, and if you're taking notes, you can, you can write this down. Jesus is the light of heaven come. Jesus is the light of heaven come so that we may become the light of Christ called out of darkness. Again, Peter words it this way, that we were called out of darkness into marvelous light. We are those who have been called out. We talked about this recently as we talked about what the church is, ecclesia. That that Greek word there means those called out. What are they called out of? They're called out of darkness into light. They are the people of light. They are the light of the world, as Christ says. We're those called out. You see then the effect of the dawning of this great gospel light on a world that's been overwhelmed by the darkness of sin. We get to see what it is now. Look at verse 18 through 25. I'm just going to kind of read this as an overview real fast. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Jesus did, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Well, they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them too. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And then look at verse 23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread all throughout Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics. And he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Those regions there are describing a multitude of people who were both Jew and Gentile. So what's the effect of the light of heaven bursting forth into the darkness of the world, you ask? The effect is called out, repentant followers committed wholly to Jesus Christ. That's one effect. The second effect is the inauguration of the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. 
This is what these healings were about. They're about the kingdom to come, the kingdom that will have no more tears, no more pain, no more sickness and disease, no more sin. Praise God. The kingdom we see in Revelation 21 and 22. The kingdom which is not yet fully realized. This kingdom, though it is dawned and is expanding, will not be fully realized until Christ returns in full glory. Where he will judge the living and the dead according to their works. Where he will save eternally those who found rest by faith in him. And he will damn eternally those who prove their love for darkness in rejecting his great gospel light. And finally, he will establish the new heaven and new earth where his people will dwell with him forever. God's people enjoying God's presence within God's place for God's purpose. It's what's happening right now. It's what's going to happen in the future. And until then, until then, you and I are to respond to Jesus like these apostles. To become fishers of men. You see, we are to cast nets and we are to mend nets so that they might be productive for casting out again. That mending means you're not casting a net that is broken. You're casting a net that is effective for catching. We must... We must prepare ourselves. We must be mended by the Holy Spirit for fishing. We must have nets that have been mended. How? By following Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. You follow Him. You come to know Him as your Lord and as your Savior. You come to know Him as a friend and as a teacher. He is our God. And when it's time to fish, you fish in his presence. You fish from his presence, with his presence. His Holy Spirit equips you to do this. In fishing, you are spreading the glory of God, which shines in the face of Jesus Christ into all the earth. What a, what a privilege. So, so catch what's happening. Not only did light dawn where it was undeserved, and now you are a proclaimer of Christ Jesus. You, you, well, and you have faith in Christ Jesus. That's not the end of your life. You are now a minister. Again, Peter, when he's talking about the kind of people the church is, he says you're a royal priesthood. You see, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. This is why we're not Catholics. This is why we're not, shouldn't be, outsourcing our Christian growth to ministers or the growth of our children to ministers only. You are a royal priesthood. This is why you shouldn't wait for someone who calls themselves an evangelist to come into your city and see people saved. God may use such people, absolutely, but God has also placed you right where he's placed you for the purpose of saving those around you. Albeit some, probably not all of them, but maybe. You see, God wants to use you in the same way he used John the Baptist, in the same way he used the apostles after Christ, in the same way he used the early church after them, in the same way he's been using Christians ever since to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and all the earth so that people might be saved. That's the mission of Christ. And real quick, if you're listening, you're like, man, I, I feel the weight of my sin. I've never professed faith in Christ. What do I do? The way one ought to repent and turn to Christ is this. Forsake your sins. All of them. Proclaim your need for a Savior. Understand that there is great darkness in you. 
and beg God for grace. Turn to God through Jesus Christ. When I say through Jesus, I mean by believing in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. That what you deserved, what darkness deserved, which is to be obliterated, Christ bore on His back so that grace might appear for us, so that we might repent and be saved. You see, Jesus is the light of heaven come so that we may become the light of Christ called out of darkness. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Father, for these men and women, boys and girls who are here now. Heavenly Father, would you equip us for following you? Would you help us as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as men and women, boys and girls who know you and want to follow you, would you help us live for you in every facet of our life? Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone who doesn't know you. Lord, I ask that you grant them repentance and faith. Lord, that they be so burdened for their sin, so understanding of their need for a Savior, that they would turn to Christ Jesus. Father, I I can't explain it, Nor do I think it's fair, but in this case, I don't want fair. Fair would mean death and not life. And so I praise you for the unfairness of grace received in Christ Jesus. That justice was executed on on your perfect son so that it may not be executed on us. Heavenly Father, help us to trust Jesus more and more and more each day. Help us to behold him that we might be transformed into his likeness and image. Help us live as light in this world. That people may come to know Christ and you, our Heavenly Father, in him. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.